Hello, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Hi. Greetings. Hi. hi. <laughs> doing good. Oh, yeah, we have this strange sound in uh, Francis's background. You know. Jesus. Yeah. Well, there's a, an airplane going by now, but... It sounds like Voldemort in the pipes. <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't okay. know what's going on. I swear there's a presence in my house that I am unaware of. <laughs> Those are some nice pictures of herbs you have on the wall there. <laughs> yeah, they're old uh, family uh, things that I've saved. Oh. Um, not my favorite herbs, but there's like basil and things like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. But I'm, uh, I love these old prints. I get, you know, I go to Europe once a year or something and I oh. guess you uh, find these everywhere, but these are actually from a, you know, like a really old. They're like, a, I had them reframed, but they're uh, oh. they probably crumple apart if we open the frame or something. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they're well, like they're, so we can talk about our origins, how we became herbals, subject mm. number one. And. Uh, we can also talk about we're probably different from when we thought we were what we thought we were going to do at the beginning. And I I'd like to hear I know a little bit more about Francis because he studied in Minnesota a little bit yeah. more at least well and of course at the acupuncture college. So I'd like to hear from uh, from Phyllis because she's got that exotic uh, Southern folk medicine, which is in her book entitled. <laughs> Southern folk medicine. Hey. Wow. Okay, I'll get started. Um, my grandmother was a midwife and an herbalist here in Alabama, and what we call the Ruth Ruth community um, in Kateka Valley. You know, and my family on my this is on my dad's side. And my dad was an herbalist and all my uncles and great uncles and great aunts were wild crafters. And that's how, you know, they made part of their living was wild crafting ginseng and blood root and pink root and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Stalingia. Um, so I started in the woods when I was 10, uh, learning the plants and helping harvest and um, following my grandmother around and doing things with her. And um, then as I got older and, and she basically wasn't doing it anymore and had retired and then, and then she passed on. My dad kind of took over um, my training. And then, you know, I, after a certain point, you know, my dad was a very old traditional Southern folk medicine. I, I'm not even sure he could tell you where your liver was, is or was. Um, but he knew how to use the plants and how to gather them and what to use them for. And so after that, I found Tommy Bass and he lives about at that time, about an hour from me. So I would go up and I spent time with him and I apprenticed with him. And then, of course, I was doing some academic study also, um, you know, and uh, got my master's degree in health studies from the University of Alabama. And um, I've worked in uh, private practice for a lot of years, uh, probably, gosh, getting on 30 years, maybe. Yeah, I hate to say that. <laughs> That, but she doesn't want to reveal how old she is. No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and uh, also I worked uh, at Brookwood Family Medicine, a medical clinic in Birmingham. It was on the campus of Brookwood Hospital. I was the herbalist and um, nutritionist at a medical center for two, almost two and a half years. I was director of herbal studies and nutrition at Clayton College of Natural Health for about 10 years. I am, um, gosh, I'm proud. I was um, director of uh, 
herbalism, herbal, the herbal practice at Common Ground Medical Clinic after Katrina for two years. Oh. So I was down there, you know, after that disaster. Um, so done a lot. Still have a private practice. I am um, currently have my own herb school here in Arab, Alabama. And uh, was one of those, if you build it, they will come things. And I built it here at the Arab in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> All right. Matthew's been here. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and people came. So I'm still doing the herb school here. And I'm still in practice here and still seeing folks. And also travel and teach. And um, um, next month I'll be in South Carolina, folks, and maybe tell you more about that later at Earthwise Learning Center. Um, but um, you know, one of the one of the things I can say about my training is I've had both traditional training, traditional folk training, and also more clinical academic training or integrate or an integrative approach. And I do think they can work well together in the right circumstance. Um, with the right people working with you. So um, I took folk medicine into a mainstream medical clinic, and it worked great. They didn't always know what I was doing, but they became so fascinated. The doctors would call me out of um, a room with my client and say, come here, I want you to see my patient. And I would go in, and they would go to their patient, hey, Stick out your tongue, let her look at your tongue. Just because they found it so fascinating that I got to look at tongues and give information. So it was, it was, um, I always felt myself to be kind of a bridge between a traditional knowledge and scientific or clinical knowledge and um, support them both to some extent, not totally. Um, but um, that's kind of my background. Who's next? I might as well be next. And uh, let's see. So I've been practicing about 34 or five years, something like that. And since I started, well, let's see, we count. Is that correct? I started, oh, maybe it's more than that. I started in 1982, I think it was, unless it was 81. <laughs> <laughs> Present Moment Herbs in South Minneapolis which was a little hippie herb store. So as herbalism died out in the main stream, the hippies came along and preserved it. And I am going to do some interviews with uh, Victor, who worked at the store in the early days, and Bob, the owner of the store. So I know. But it was quite a place then, and it's still in existence. So um, it's... It's pretty interesting. So I worked there. Oh, I already, so I started studying herbalism at age 13 and through my teens, mostly I was in college, I was studying botany at the university. I couldn't understand the herbal books because it was just astringent, amenagogue, diaphoretic, diuretic. Like, mm -hmm. there already no herbalism to read those books. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and in those days, there was just uh, Jethro Kloss, um, Joseph Meyer, oh, Maud Grieve, of course. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was what was available. And um, so, uh, and so I learned a little bit. So, but I found homeopathy much more, much more easier to understand and when i was working there at the store a group of books came up for sale quite a few like i got maybe 30 homeopathy books at a used bookstore an old homeopath had died we didn't know he existed but he died and that was a great boon to me and um it's funny when i so about the time the herb store opened i think it was 1981 um uh i i decided to order a homeopathic home remedy kit and my father said, oh, why don't you get one of those for me, too? Uh, my Uncle Rushmore had one of those little kits. And I was like, I never heard of that. <laughs> 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 and indeed, I found, so we found out, actually, homeopathy ran in the family. My 
My grandfather, they said, was delivered by a Quaker homeopath, no, chiropractic doctor in 1900. Well, since chiropractic was founded in Iowa in 1900, and that didn't seem very likely, but what we found was it was a Quaker homeopathic doctor. And lo and behold, a guy came to a Quaker meeting from New Jersey, where my grandfather came from, was born in his grandfather was a Quaker homeopathic physician from Trenton, New Jersey, where granddad came from. And so we asked his mother when she visited, and she said, oh, I'll look up in the records and see if if uh, they're, if they, this, they were, uh, you know, they did know each other. In fact, we actually found out my grandfather and his grandfather were first cousins. Anyways, we found that out. But she looked it up and she said, no. My yeah, my grand my father was your family, your grandfather's um, family physician, but he was out of town that day. So his best friend, who was a Quaker homeopathic physician, delivered the baby. So this homeopathy ran quite deep, and my parents got that kit, and they continued to use it. And on my mother's side, my cousin Julian Winston, uh, it was a big wig in homeopathy. So so that was kind of a, in my twenties, I studied and practiced. A little bit of homeopathy and then started at the herb store and i practiced more homeopathy and bob practiced more herbalism and we kind of switched because my true love was herbalism and i studied and got to know the homeopathic remedies that were herbs like hypericum st john's work calendula chamomile bone set or eupatorium uh, that half dozen dozen um sambucus uh, elder then I also got to know the homeopathic, the herbal, the Dr. Box flower essences that were used as herbs. Oh, I have to, I have to say I had to reconstruct herbalism. That was true of just about everybody, every herbalist in my generation, except Phyllis. They had no teachers, you know, we had no teachers. Almost all of us, uh, Rosemary would be a, an exception there. Rosemary Gladstar. So so it was. <clears throat> so I studied then the flower essences. So I got to know agrimony, blue vervain or vervain oak, the ones that I knew in my own environment. And so they translated from a mental emotional state, like oak, stri- strive on against adversity, never give up, but never succeed. Then that kind of is a personality, and then you realize it's for uh, totally broken down structural tissue, like a really strong astringent, boom, get that tissue up again, because it's like the mighty oak is broken down. So I could understand these metaphors, these doctrine signatures, and that was my original guiding light. And through the years at the herb store, we practiced and practiced and learned, and it was great. It was really, really something. It was a new, a new experience. We were proving that herbalism worked really I know it sounds incredible, but that's actually what most of my generation, they have first had to prove to themselves that it worked. And I mean, I've heard this even, uh, and on, and there was a prominent chiropractor who did some herbalism in St. Paul. And one of my clients and patients had worked with him and they tried, I think it was a poultice of like horseradish or something on a, cyst on a uterine cyst and, and it worked and they were just almost clapping because you know herbs work herbs work you know it's the early 70s mid 70s so finally I, I but so this was what's called empirical medicine use what works and empirical medicine often is based on the doctrine of signatures galen notes that uh, 2000 years ago so that the empiricists or village herbalists used the doctor and signature. So I learned that, but so then little by little, I wanted to know other things. I wanted to learn energetics and so on. And that really, I, that was illustrated to me. Uh, a guy came to Minneapolis. This is so funny. Adam Liebling, he'd been in my high school and he really wanted to look me up because, you know, you always kind of look up to the older kids a year or two ahead of you. And I was a year or two ahead of him. So I never noticed him, but he noticed me. So, so he looked me up and he taught me, I think he sat in on six cases and from him, I began to learn vata, pitta, kapha, which you learned. You didn't mention your uh, Indian teachers in the, uh, in the Huntsville that you learned from Phyllis. But but so vata, pitta, kapha. And also I tried to study Chinese medicine, but it just didn't fit for me as to Western. And, and from so there was the element, the five elements, and there's yin and yang, excess and deficiency. And finally, I latched on the six tissue states that are mentioned by the 
physio medicalist and so I, I uh, rediscovered kind of from that 19th century work the the tissue states how to describe what the tissues seem and look like i remember another thing that led me was or, organ specificity there was one homeopath who would treat with uh, spleen remedies liver remedies uh, gallbladder remedies liver remedies heart remedies etc and that's really quite good there's many plants that are rather specific to a certain organ and, and this is actually quite justified scientifically because the organ develops in its own matrix, its own little bag of fascia and um, serous fluid. And that's a little universe to itself separate from other little bags that are developing in the fetus or the baby or the child or the grown up. Um, those organs all have their own little, you know, thermostat. Right. Yeah. So they, that, so it's quite justified to treat by organ. And so that was another tradition. And finally, then I, I felt like I needed to, I, more and more, I, I paid attention, got to know about regular medicine. It's not, I, I, I've never been completely trained in modern pathology. I don't think I could stand it, but, um, but I know, you know, I know 75, 80% of what, of the medical, medical jargon that comes by my ear. Just yesterday, someone emailed me. Did you know? Have you ever treated bronchi, bronchi, bronchiolar, bronchi, bronchiolitis, uh, um, obliterans? That sounded pretty bad. Like, no, I haven't. But um, what's most important in herbalism is that you describe what the tissue is like, and so um, that. Uh, so you be very practical. You don't get scared. You don't say, oh, I don't know, golly, I better make it seem like I do know it. You sit there. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> and this is medicine in people's lives, after all. And even if, <laughs> and even if it wasn't, it's their money, if you're making money from it. So, so you actually just say, no, I haven't heard of that. Can, can you describe it? But you always do want to, what is the tissue doing? And um, what are the that, patterns of dysfunction? Yes, yeah. And also, if you can visualize what's going on there, it helps a lot, too. Yeah. Yeah, and also, one important thing that I mentioned that Phyllis and I mentioned at the beginning of our class, um, number one on um, how to take a case and everything, is, is, if, is, is that we can't diagnose. So if the doctor says it's bronchiolitis obliterans, then... Yeah, okay, that's okay. But we can't say that. We can say, I suspect that, go in and get tested or something. But but what we can't say is, is oh, yeah, that's hot, that's cold, that's a hot liver, cold liver. You know, that's energetic medicine. And they can't say that because that's not in their scope of practice. But we can, and that's why it, it's not illegal for us to say that. So just to hurry along, I practiced eight years at present moment, three, three, four years at Crescent Terra, uh, a chiropractic clinic in St. Paul, Dr. Mary Rutherford, who's occasionally on some of our links and stuff, and a um, uh, great chiropractor. And I had a few other chiropractic friends, so they also helped uh, Dave Milgram teaching me um, more about the muscular skeletal, um, because there's a lot of things Eric's can do in that area. And then... Um, uh, and then I started practice on my own, which is never what I expected. And I continued to learn. So in the 90s, I got to know someone from the Clayton College. And then she, <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say she passed on, unfortunately. Oh, that's right. Great. My predecessor. Yes. And then Phyllis called me, kind of took up a year later, kind of, I hadn't heard from this woman, but I knew she had cancer. So not hearing from her was a little bit, uh oh. And then Phyllis called and kind of, I'm starting this back up again. And I kind of tested Phyllis and I asked her. And she I, he did. I asked her, oh, so what do you use? Do you use bone set for setting bones? Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Do you use solid seal, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, nobody used it for that. You know, I mean, it was like nobody except we had a teacher or I don't I know that he was a te he was my teacher, but he was more of a. A contemporary of yours in your he lived in your area we we can call him he who must not be named 
Right, and, right. And uh, it's probably okay to mention, I, I know that Francis would know him as Tismo, but... Um, Tismo. Yeah, uh, but... Alabama like, boy. Yep, he taught me all these, probably Tennessee actually a little bit more, but... Um, yeah. But, yeah, he taught all these herbs that were exactly in common with Phyllis. So, so Exactly. And I have to give him credit. Sometimes he and I were so close in mind that we really learned from each other psychically. So sometimes I learned things like Solomon Seal. He didn't really teach me anything much about that. But boom, I learned all this stuff just being around him. So I have to give him some credit that way too. <clears throat> but so actually, Phyllis and I have a little bit more in common than would normally be the case. And then I have to thank her for teaching me Southern blood medicine, high blood, low blood, thick blood, thin blood, etc., because that's very helpful. And uh, it's not just an energetic system. Um, it's more of a, it's a monitoring life, slow developments in the body. The blood thickens, the blood thins, the blood goes higher, the blood goes lower. Very practical. So, um, so she was one of my teachers. And you just keep on going on. You never stop learning. William Lasassier, a great teacher, he taught us. Uh, then finally, he was Adam Liebling's teacher. And finally, I got to meet him and learn some at his feet, too. He passed on. He uh, died about 15 years ago. And Margie Flint and I both learned a lot from him and kind of teach each other what we can. We learned about 1% of what he knew. So there's my story. And... Um, uh, Francis. Francis. Yes. <laughs> oh, unmute someone. Francis or Tara, unmute. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Here I am. Yeah. Alive and well. <laughs> um, let's see. Hopefully the sound is okay. So, um, well, let's see. I was born uh, in 1982, so I think around the time. Matt <laughs> practice, so yeah, right. I think that was good timing on my part. So when I was about 20, 20 years old, I he'd accumulated twenty years of experience, and it's good time for me to start learning. <laughs> so um, let's see. I'm uh, yeah. So I'm uh, I started studying herbs around when I was twenty, when all my friends were out partying and things like that. I was uh, deep in books and obsessed with herbs. Um, so I was, uh, I feel lucky that I started so young because I'm only 36 now and I've already been practicing for like 12, 14 years or something like that. And um, I can't say there was much, uh, it's not like I come from an herbalist uh, family, although some of the family in Europe so my grandparents came to Quebec, Canada, and we still have family in Europe. And we would uh, go back to France when I was little in the villages. And I would see people doing this herbal stuff and natural medicine. And so when I was, uh, I think, uh, young, it kind of caught my eye. And also, uh, they still have a lot of traditional markets there where they sell spices and huge bags. Um, like you don't see so much in the... In North America anymore. So, uh, and through a series of uh, crazy events, I moved to Minnesota at the age of uh, 20 or so, and I met uh, Lise Wolf, who uh, is maybe not so well known, but she's a wonderful herbalist, and she was one of Matthew's old apprentices um, from that time. And I started studying with her. Uh, uh, very intensively and uh, ended up doing an apprenticeship with Lise Wolf and later on sitting with Matthew and just kind of a, I'm a big nerd so I spent about 10 years reading about her and, uh, I like the old stuff so if you really want to learn herbs you have, to, you have to kind of stop start from the ancient times and work your way to modern times because uh, modern medicine is more uh, is very young, and they're always looking towards the future. They're like looking for the next machine or the next molecule. 
whatever was there like five years ago is now total crap or they had it wrong. So we're on to the next thing all the time. <laughs> but herbs, it's, uh, you have to get these old time principles. So you have to kind of read the books from a thousand years ago or something. So you kind of get how humans have thought about herbs for a long time and you kind of uh, let that seep into you. So um, uh, I teach a lot about the, this kind of old thinking and I, uh, I find it very helpful if you want to be a good herbalist and understand how herbs work and the logic. And that's kind of uh, studying plants on their own terms. Um, so you study plants from uh, where they grow, what kind of soil they grow in, what kind of weather, and you constantly kind of study uh, seasons and soils and where plants grow and how they grow and where they survive and don't survive. That's like studying how the plants act and are on their own terms. Um, as uh, humans, we try to make a lot of uh, energetic models, but they always... Uh, they're great, but they fall. They always fall a little bit short because uh, we can't mimic exactly the complexity of nature. So uh, that's one uh, recommendation. If you're a young herbalist, you have to really spend a lot of time uh, outside and studying uh, different uh, patterns of nature. So you can't get that from a book, but you get other stuff from books, like uh, funny stories and all kinds of practical stuff. Um, and so, uh, let's see, I went to acupuncture school, so I have a lot of Chinese medicine education in me as well. Although I use, uh, don't use too many Chinese herbs anymore because I'm just using so many, so many local uh, plants and I'm trying to make uh, plants that no one's using. I'm trying to bring them back into popularity. So um, I've cut down on the use of Chinese herbs because of that, simply. But uh, what's interesting about Chinese medicine, which even modern Chinese practitioners don't, uh, it's not really taught anymore, is um, back in the day, it was kind of a seasonal medicine. So it was like a directional medicine. And uh, that's really uh, herbal, I would say almost universal, looking at the seasons and how seasons affect people and um, it's like in old-time medicine I think the weather was like 90% of uh, the cause of health problems because you're constantly fighting off the environment fighting off cold or heat or damp and um, the more I study this stuff the more I become crazy with uh, about the weather <laughs> uh, I find it's actually at the root cause of so many illnesses and even nowadays. So, um, and I'll give a, a case history because that. It's really true. So just last week, I had a guy come in for chronic fatigue. Um, a young guy too, like healthy, you know, athletic, uh, healthy looking and never been sick before in his life. In the past, uh, let's see, six years, he's had like chronic fatigue and no one can figure it out. And, his blood tests are fairly okay, except for sometimes uh, like a one molecule will be off. So they're like trying to follow that uh, <laughs> at the track. Like, oh, maybe it's B12. You know, for some reason, your body's not absorbing vitamin B12. So that might be why you're having all these problems. And so that's the red reductionist model that we have since about 100 years now. Um, so all-time medicine looks at the, the whole and the seasons and the patterns behind everything. So this guy was in Haiti uh, right before this all started, and he, he was in the great uh, earthquake that happened in Haiti in, uh, let's see, 2011, I believe. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, well, I think most, most of the planet was aware of that. Which earthquake was that? Uh, let's see, this was in 2011, I think around January. A huge earthquake in uh, Haiti, it was a big deal. Yeah, okay. And, uh, well, there's a big Haitian popu population in Quebec because of French language, so it was, you know, it was all over the news here, of course, and I think in the U.S. too. I mean, it was a big, oh. bigger people. Uh, and uh, this guy was there, and um, and his sister was caught uh, in the capital there, Paul Prince, Porto Prince, and he was like in the country and. 
So I mentioned to him, like, well, maybe he started being chronic fatigue after the earthquake. You know, you had kind of a shock. And he's like, well, maybe. And he's like, he's seen like 20 practitioners of all sorts, including doctors. And he's like, well, geez, you're the second person to say that. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> then I went further. So when you study these old principles that underlie herbalism, um, it's a lot about seasons and weather patterns and nature patterns. So he's a, he's from a cold climate, and he was there in uh, January, which in Quebec is very cold. So he's, his body is acclimated to the intense cold, and, and he went to a really hot, humid place. So um, I told him, well, you know, you had a big like trauma, a big shock. You saw people dying and around you, and you thought maybe you were going to die because he was a he was a white man, and uh, it's like it was like survival mode over there. So he kind of became like a maybe a prey or something, because <laughs> um, obviously he was more privileged, uh, even being a young guy. So what basically uh, I explained to him that his head and body became very vulnerable as a result of this like nervous shock. And so the weather pattern over there kind of got into him. It's not like it attacks you, but when you're weak, it just gets into you and stays there. And so his main symptom was a very heavy head. Like his chronic fatigue was like, his head was always heavy. So that's like a, like Matthew was talking about tissues. So that's like damp, that's like damp in the head. So that's, in terms of herbalism, that's kind of real simple, actually, when you understand these old patterns. It's like, oh, your head's super damp. That's all, the, that's all, that's all that's going on. <laughs> you just need plants for dampness in the head. And, um, and so I asked him, so, is I the first person to tell you that, that theory? <laughs> so he's like, yeah, you're the first person to say dampness got into my head. So I was like, that's good. We got something original here for your case. And so he, he got the plants that uh, dry out the head, like uh, calamus root, and uh, let's see, maybe two or three other things. Uh, but plants are very aromatic. Cause so very aromatic plants are like a fresh wind coming in to blow out that stagnant air. And let's see, what else did he get? Um, he got calamus root and probably a few other aromatic uh, plants for that, that are special for the throat or the sinus area or the head. And, um, so um, this is all to say uh, this is a this is like a serious case. This guy's been sick for six years and no one can figure it out. So you can really help someone by studying these old time things that people think maybe aren't of no use anymore, but they have a place in modern days and. Uh, Part of being a herbalist is kind of understanding these principles that are, they're like behind the curtain of herbalism. Because in herbs, we look at molecules, we look at flavors and energetics, hot, cold, but there's these principles that are behind the curtain. And it's, uh, they're like the patterns of nature and how they affect human bodies. So that's really important. Uh, at least it's been really important for me uh, in practice. Uh, I find it's... Uh, and they can sometimes make a very serious case uh, seem like very simple and almost like a cartoon. So, and of course, uh, once you figure that out, you still have to know like 30 to 70 good plants so you can actually give something. <laughs> so, it's not all easy, but uh, uh, that's been a big influence on me. And that's uh, been from studying. Uh, really old Chinese medicine books. They don't get studied in the colleges anymore, but uh, old time Chinese medicine was about direction. So that's another thing. If someone was, uh, say it's uh, winter time, uh, but you're really hot and sweating, it's like it's summertime in your body. So you need to shift the seasonal pattern inside the person's body because we're, they're not connected to the winter season. So, and you find these, uh, these kinds of concepts in the, like Nicholas Culpepper's old book, and then in Europe as well, uh, they talk a lot about uh, maybe a bit more from the astro astrological standpoint, but uh, one way to look at that is actually, so there's planets in the sky that affect uh, everything on the, on the Earth, but then there's 
it creates weather. So the weather affects the humans and then the weather affects the plants. So some plants grow and they absorb a lot of sunlight. Some plants grow out in the woods and they're like plants of the moon. They only, they're always in the shade. And people's bodies are like uh, seasons, uh, too hot, too damp, too dry. So, and that's like the tissue states, but it's more like the universal tissue states or something like that. Uh, so this kind of thing is real uh, helpful when you get into herbalism to be aware of the, these concepts. And uh, I would say the other thing that's been real helpful is studying uh, constitutions. So like Matthew mentioned, bata, pitta, kapha, this kind of thing is very helpful. But you also have, uh, if you read old uh, literature, again, Nicholas Culpepper, you, they, they had all these con kinds of constitutions, like the person who faints all the time. This is like often, uh, it's women and men, it's a lot of young women, but uh, guys I get this too, they, they have a small emotion or stress and they, they faint, you know? We call that a vagal shock, I think, in modern medicine. Uh, it's like you have a little stress and you, your body faints. That's the that's that kind of constitution, that's that kind of profile. This person, they walk in a room and they get like queasy. Mm -hmm. And they had remedies for that. And you got the, per the person who's always uh, a certain way. So that's an old principle too. It's like knowing what kind of person is sick and not necessarily what kind of sickness someone has. Um, so that's been uh, very helpful. And let's see, there's a question here. Uh, if I can recommend any old Chinese medical text. Well, so yeah, um, that's a bit of a, so the, the main- Let's recommend Hong Huang Huang for the herbs at least. We, yeah, yeah, that's a so that's a great one. So uh, I'll recommend two, a modern one and an old one. So there's a Dr. Uh, Huang Huang. Uh, let's see, I'll uh, type it in here. Um, I can find that for you, Francis. Oh, yeah, and I think, uh, oh, wow, great, Matthew. All right, and I just typed his name. It's uh, the same word twice, but in Chinese, it's not the same word. It's two different words such as the Chinese language. Uh, and he has a few books out uh, in the English language, and they're very good. Uh, Dr. Huang Kong is like a Matthew Wood of Chinese herbalism, really. And uh, that's very rare. Uh, Chinese herbal medicine is actually fairly different, especially modern, than uh, what you might learn from uh, studying with Matthew Wood or Phyllis Light. And, uh, Oh, Francis just froze up. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, my back. Okay. Uh, Dr. Huang Huang is a great uh, reference for herbs and uh, very, very good, very open, very, uh, very good. Uh, but so an old text in Chinese medicine that's good is the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine. Unfortunately, um, it's very, it's kind of difficult to understand because it talks about all these cosmic patterns and weather patterns and the translations are usually very poor uh, so you kind of have to study the classical Chinese characters um, which I do but which is not uh, so easy or uh, you have to find a good source um, but if you can basically if you just read that one book you're good like that has all the info in there so it's like a it's not that uh, you don't have to read like 30 old books or something and, uh, let's see. Yellow Emperor's Classic of Chinese Medicine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. The, uh, they even, so uh, nowadays, uh, like when we get some other plants, we say, oh, we'll give you this, uh, this formula. But in China, they didn't call it the word for formula. It's not formula, and it gets translated like that. It's direction. So they would say they would give someone a direction because, like I said, it's all about seasons and which direction you're going. And if you're not going with the seasonal flow, then you're kind of getting sick because you're kind of your body's going against all this universal force that's shaping everything that's happening. So plants would be like a direction to get you back into the correct. Well, yeah, we could say the correct direction. Uh -huh. um, so that was the big concept. And uh, old time European herbalism was a little different, but the, the astrological thing, uh, it kind of gets back to that. It's 
getting someone aligned back with seasonal patterns and patterns of the universe. And then your body is more like breathing with with everything. So you're not like living life differently. Um, so that may sound that may sound a bit weird because today we like to do whatever we want. <laughs> like like freedom and I don't care about anything, but uh, old time medicine is kind of based on nature patterns. So they, they don't care about modern morals. It's like, uh, it's like, well, that's what it is. If you, if you uh, spend 10 hours bare feet in the snow, then you'll get frozen legs and then you'll have arthritis in 10 years. And that's it. So, and, uh, let's see what else. Um, Last thing I would suggest if people want to learn herbs is to find a good teacher who practices and try to apprentice and basically sit next to them for a year or so. And uh, kind of, it's not you want to learn their like little secrets, what herbs they use for this or that. You more want to learn how they, how they think as an herbalist, how they, you want to learn how to think as an herbalist, how to think in bigger patterns. So you just want to see someone doing that for a while. And then you can kind of, even if you're left to your own devices, you can figure out what plants to give to people once you kind of know these basic principles. They're really the important ground to stand on. And um, let's see. Um, well, let's see. I want to comment. For now. Oh, okay. I want to comment on uh, calamus. I think all three of us can understand that one. That totally makes sense for drawing out the brain. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's not one I use much, but Phyllis can understand that, I think. Yeah. I think, and actually, that's not just a North American plant, but Chinese. European, uh, yeah, and I literally grows in uh, South of Africa. It apparently grows all over the globe. So. Oh. Wow. Oh. The people from uh, Madagascar and all these areas, and they, they know about calamus. And they, like, <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, and also uh, the dampness, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, let's see, who was it, our friend? I think it was Yulia Graves or her husband, Jimpa, who they were in Haiti, and they said there was a difference between, like, children born before the earthquake and after. Like, it was night and day. Like, even the children in the womb were, like, disturbed, were, like, psychologically upset. Yeah. 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 And That's then, something, uh, so we... Uh, we uh, we have a little book on false diagnosis, and uh, yeah. yeah, you can pick up on a lot of a person's life history if you get good at feeling the pulse. So recently, I was teaching a course, and a twenty-year-old girl was there, and I was taking her pulse, and uh, I said, "Geez, do you have a pulse like your family, like you were born in the war time, or your family went through the war or something?" And she's like a twenty-year-old in Montreal here, so. Maybe what I said, but right away she said, "Yeah, my mom, my mom immigrated here, and she she went through the war." Uh, let's see, and I forget where she was from, but uh, her mom was pregnant with her during a, a war, so she had the pulse of a child who the nervous system was really like amped, amped up. So that's like a a war pulse, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I also wanted to point out, let's see, so I would use so damp heat in the summertime. Yeah, um, I would use the homeopathic uh, gelsemium, which is yellow jasmine that uh, grows down there, uh, yeah. at, mm -hmm. least, at least fairly close to Phyllis's place. And Phyllis, no, I do res here. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, it's been blooming lately. Oh, wow. So I wonder if that would be good for chronic fatigue with uh, yeah. uh, this kind of damp... Uh, profile yeah let's see um oh i just mentioned on chronic fatigue yeah that one's good for that kind of uh lethargy of hot summer weather but one chronic fatigue remedy that i rely on again and again and again is uh baptisia yeah slightly toxic oh you probably know about that one yeah for the people who really have the the uh epstein-barr virus or whatnot yeah never been well since mono that just works again and again. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, Phyllis, what do you use for hot, damp weather? Uh, golden seal and black walnut. Oh, wow. Oh, different. The walnut. Well, totally different. Like and 
Sometimes I throw in a little chickweed to uh, to soften it a bit, but yeah. Actually, I can see that on black walnut. Um, uh, my friend, um, Mary Pat Palmer in California, you may know her herbalist. Um, she had a dream yeah. where walnuts said to her, this is California. It's the same walnut tree, but it's a different climate. Said, you right. can tell I'm a water medicine because I um, leaf out after the last rain and my leaves fall off before the first rain. And so it manages water, it said. Well, so then they used it. She and her, her friend uh, Andy Andy Taylor, great herbalist in little team town out there, and he uh, he used it. He had a guy who had sixty cc's of water in his lungs, and they sent him home to die. And uh, yeah, they got almost all of it out in one night with the black walnut. And so that black walnut has that ability to expel water. And I've used it also arthritis. Um, or things like that, that bubbles of water uh, just under the skin, in the skin. So I could see it having a bubble of water in your head, too. Yeah, and, and golden seal for mucous membrane, tissues, dry them out. Yeah, okay. move it, help move it. Uh, everything you said about black walnut. Um, and, but it, black walnut is also relaxing. So it helps relax all the tightness mm -hmm. that is holding the dampness in. Oh. And um, so then it can begin to move and drain easily. And black walnut is also lymphatic. But I throw in a little chickweed sometimes to soften it a touch and to thin what's coming down, mm -hmm. what needs moving, all that dampness being held in. We have a lot of damp head heat in the south. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it gets into your head and <laughs> doesn't want to leave. <laughs> so I think this is a, a good kind of illustration of um, the kind of thought or the importance of something Francis was saying, go study with a teacher. So we have the same sort of uh, damp heat in the head, and we have three different views on how to deal with it. And we've all had success using what we were using. So, and we all kind of had different thought processes on how to move the damp um, and disperse the heat from the head um, using different herbs. So, you know, one thing I would say if you want to become an excellent herbalist is study with as many different teachers as you can. And yeah. learn how they're doing it. As Francis said, learn their thought processes. There's often overlap from one teacher to the other, but then you're going to have something totally, absolutely different like this. Um, that then you can um, have the opportunity to um, to learn something new and something that might apply in your area. Um, you know, for example, in the in Southern folk medicine, we have seasonal stuff um, the way um, maybe they do in TCM. We don't say directions, but it's all about the land and um, what's happening on the land and how hot is it, which is gets pretty darn hot and how damp is it and how much pollen is there out right now, <laughs> vast amounts. How good is the water you're drinking? So I think if we just even look in the Western tradition back to Hippocrates, who wrote, what was that book he wrote, Matthew? Um, air, airs? Well, on airs, waters, and places, I think. On airs, waters, and places. I mean, that whole book is about the importance of where you live, what, how the wind is blowing, what the wind is bringing to you because the wind can bring sickness. Yeah. And, um, you know, so this is, I think it is uh, universal, that sort of thought process of the land and our health because we're connected, right? The health of the land is the health of us. Um, if our land isn't healthy, we're not healthy. And um, so, um, Keep that in mind too. But study with as many teachers as you can 
and all over the country, all over. And it makes it so much easier because we have this online thing we can do now. You don't even have to go there anymore. Mm. You can just figure out how to do it online, right? <laughs> um, but still be able to get that information. And the other thing is practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Practice, 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 practice. Hard to do, but just on your friends and family. Absolutely. Uh, uh, one really good step, I think. Dogs, you can't. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> start in an herb store if there is one nearby. Um, Absolutely. Or a, or a vitamin or co-op or something or other like that. Yeah. Forget I it. tell my students that working in a health food store or a herb shop is like working in the emergency room. Yeah. yeah. People come in and say, I have this problem. And you have 10 minutes to engage them and help them figure out what's going on. It's like the emergency room. And it's the greatest learning experience in the world. You have to do it fast. You don't get to sit down for an hour. Like I say, you have 10 minutes, right? You'll also learn amazing stories from them, too. And I'll give one. Always listen. So this old guy used to come into the store, Will, Will Warner. He was quite a... Mm, important person in the settlement of uh, in the suburb uh, Bloomington in Minnesota there. But um, he told me, oh yeah, my uh, mother was uh, half uh, Ojibwe from northern Minnesota. I grew up on this farm uh, up there. And he told me this incredible case history, just one. He only gave me one case history, but it just was so amazing that the, his grandfather would hire uh, summer labor from the reservation where his mother's father came from. And um, so he, uh, there was a young man, and he seemed to die. He, you know, got quite, and he just was lying there. And so they sent for a medicine woman. Took six hours. They built a sweat lodge. Her, her his mother was able to go inside because she was uh, half Ojibwe, and they, and she described that um, this guy he was unconscious or dead or whatever, and didn't appear to be breathing. And she took out. She they did a ceremony, and she took out the owl pellets, the little. Uh, vomit of an owl that, that little rodent bones and stuff and oh, stuff that's, that's gross well it wasn't it was dried out you know you never find it fresh but it was dried out and he she stuck it down his throat and about 20 minutes later he came came back to consciousness well well that totally makes sense because that's the vomit reflex which at uh, the throat again francis it's yeah, right. great vomit the, remedy yeah. here the vagus nerve it's like I, I told John and Tara about this one time and I said to John, you could invent a medical device here. And like, you know, I mean, it's just a great thing for, I mean, the last nerve that's going to be live is going to be the vagus nerve. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that gag reflex is probably the most important, you know, reflex. Yeah. Left. So like, Holy cow, you know? So I learned that in the herb store and you just, you never know. And just all these things, that they'll pass on. It's real folk medicine. It's a lot of, you know, what's advertised, but it's also kind of what's worked. So that's one place to learn. Yeah. And someone, uh, Ian asked how to learn from um, uh, Native American knowledge. And well, that's a little bit, (laughs) it's luck a little bit. Um, You got to live in a place where there's, I, I mean, even in Minnesota, I'd say, you know, well, I could say in, in Minneapolis there, Paul Red Oak teaches some. There was Tismo in the old days. He's dead now. Uh, Phyllis herself, she didn't mention that her grandmother was a Creek Indian, but she knows a lot of um, not just Southern folk medicine, but Creek medicine. And D- David Winston teaches a lot mixed in with this Cherokee medicine, but he teaches that too. But um, uh, it's not easy to find um and to some extent you just the doors will open for whoever you are with whatever teachers um it happened for the first six teachers seven eight that i had all but william associate were in fact native americans it was kind of weird i didn't seek that out but it kept on happening um so let's see herb shops people working in herb shops to uh better Consulting skills. Let's really uh, emphasize that because um, we're probably not going into that on our, our evening classes, Phyllis and I. But and we just built it up there. Does somebody have a puppy in the background? Oh. Yeah, let me close my window. Sorry. 
No, we, we got Voldemort out of the computer. <laughs> yeah, right. But, uh, well, the, fixed, the right? coyotes are are coming out about this time of day, and then my dogs go crazy from the other side of the fence, barking at the coyotes. <laughs> oh, coyotes! Oh, yeah. Okay, oh. that's that is the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's I live on Main Street in Arab, Alabama. <laughs> oh, right. That's actually well, happening I mean, <laughs> somewhere and somewhere else. It's somewhere else. So I think if you're working in, in an herb shop and um, wanting to develop better consulting skills, I would say make yourself a checklist. What do you want to ask everybody? I mean, maybe only like on your checklist, maybe only have five or six questions that you you can begin to ask. Number one, are you taking any medications? Or what is there a medical diagnosis and what is it? Is there a medical diagnosis? Are you on medications? Do you have any allergies? Okay. I mean, that should be like basic questions for almost anybody in any situation. But if you're in a health food store and you're gonna buy something you want to make sure you're not getting massive interactions right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people will gather bundles of bottles in health food stores, you know, like six or seven different things that they leave with. Um, it's useful to make sure there's no major interactions with your nutritional supplements and the drugs that they might be taking. Um, you know, Basic questions like what what's your diet like are basic questions like um, are you sleeping at night? How's your stress level? You know, you won't have time to get detailed um, the way you would in a consultation or maybe even be as um, have the time to be as intuitive or tune in to the person or the plant, because you've only got like maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but create a checklist for yourself that, you know, you can kind of memorize and run through that'll help, you know, you stay on track in the conversation too, before it, before it gets sidetracked too much and you lose and you can keep them engaged. As long as you're asking the person, the customer questions that's going to keep them engaged with you and help you kind of like take that quick consultation a little bit further. So um. yeah, there's also an important one important intuitive thing. Actually, this is valuable in practice too, but it's real important in the herb store is there's people that just want attention and there's people that actually want help. And there's people then that want help that is in line with, they already have a fixed idea of what they want. And they don't really want your advice about what to do. They kind of want your idea of what herb would fit into what they've already figured out. So you there's got, that. Because <laughs> they've already been on the internet and they've yeah. already figured out what's wrong with them and what herbs they want today. Yeah. So you either so you you become aware of what uh, what I used to I hate to say it, but so the owner of my store was. Uh, drug dealer <laughs> and I and, and I learned from him how to take a case history which was to find out what was their um was it, what were they really looking for <laughs> well, yeah and then he would interact with people he because he was always really careful what do they really want because that was that was part of his business and uh so um uh that's that's what I mean here like this is important with uh, clients as well, but it's really important in the herb store because there's what I call time wasters, people that just want attention. They don't really want help. And I'll tell you another, a secret is like, you might think, oh, golly, they want to listen to me. They want my attention. They want my attention, <laughs> but you should avoid that. But you you say, oh, uh-huh, okay. All right. But don't engage with them a whole lot because then that becomes a habit. And then all these people it's not like they're all friends. It's like they're all attracted to your light bulb, your energy, because, oh, wow, there's somebody that gives all their energy away to, to people like me, gives attention to because, of, <laughs> because yeah. that's what I want. And I knew one practitioner in Minnesota, and he, he was a good homeopath in, in the first generation. He had a seven years, and he built up six years practice, 
and he had all these people who are medically dependent, middle-aged, older people, and uh, and he couldn't stand it. He took a um, year off sabbatical and came back and started his practice over because he built up that sort of medically dependent um, clientele. And I know practitioners who live for years off of that clientele, but that's not really uh, the best road. <laughs> and sometimes um, clients and customers in health food stores, they they have a, a kind of this rigid thought pattern going already. Either they already know what they want and it may not even be the right thing for, for them. If you ask them those few little questions up front and figure out what's going on, you might could suggest something better or even give them information about better information about what they've decided they need. But also they can be a bit quirky. Um, I had one client once who said that she could never do an herb that had a G in its name. <laughs> and that because they were all poison. <laughs> and so this left out ginseng, ginkgo, I mean, ginkgo, go to coal. I mean, the, the list was amazingly long of herbs that she wouldn't do because it was a G in the name. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I know. But that was this thought pattern that she had going, and she was going to not move past that. That, that was the, like the most super rigid. That was her number one thing. No, I'll do anything at some that I can't well, do. That. Did, did Google Oo finally kill her? <laughs> uh, no, double breast cancer did. Unfortunately, um, she was really sick and didn't know it. But that's a, another story. Um, yeah. But but you know, people do get into kind of rigid thought patterns sometimes um, that come into the health food stores. And then there are some people who have no idea of what they want when they come in the health food store. It's all new. It's um, They're hesitant because they've never tried an herb before. Um, and they're branching into this whole new area. And uh, they're a newbie. And um, they really do want your assistance. And they really do want your help. Um, and they just want need to be led gently into this new world that they're now ready to explore. Right. And yeah. Sometimes clients that come to see you and they've never been to an herbalist or mm -hmm. nutritionist or anything before. And they're, they're taking this step through this doorway that maybe five or 10 years ago, they like, never could have conceived. Right. And Lee, whose name has a G in it comments, um, good thing. <laughs> Blue vervain doesn't have a G. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The fanatic. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that I, think, uh, I think people, uh, I might add quick to, uh, yes. if you can look at a, a tongue quickly, even if you work in a herb shop, you can just quickly look at a person's tongue, at least uh, in terms of safety, it can kind of give you like a snapshot of the person's uh, yeah, issue state and kind of give you like 10, 20 herbs that, oh, okay, they have a pale tongue. I can give something warming and I'll be in the safe and they'll probably help. Yeah. And so that's, a, I think mean, that's a real quick, helpful diagnostic thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, you know. Yeah. Also, I was going to say, if you can do the energetics, which is, um, so you, you just ask, you know, do you feel better from hot weather, cold weather, or better from mm -hmm. damp? or you know just a few establish a few parameters in energetics and then the tongue fits into that it happened that i would always do pulse diagnosis in the store but um or pulse, pulse evaluation rather but um I, <laughs> actually, yes the, the tongue is arrested uh, yeah. yeah the tongue is even though the three of us wrote a book about pulse diagnosis which is great by the way and you guys all 55 you should buy it or 63 or 75 or whatever it is but um but uh, so uh, um, pulse is really helpful, but and get and that is a quick minutes snapshot can even be. But tongue is a little bit easier, and yeah, pale or red or purplish, bluish rather more common. Dry or damp is definitely dry or damp. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah, so you got a couple minutes to figure out where they're coming from. 
and what makes them comfortable. In a couple of minutes, you can maybe ask questions. I mean, you can stand in the aisle for 20 minutes, but. Uh, um, right. Yeah. And, and another quick helpful thing is um, look at their face. Is their face red? Is it, do they have red cheeks, red nose? You know, take a look. I like to look at wrist and legs if I can just quickly glance because I can look at a wrist and go, oh, super thin, you know, we've got an air person here, or at least partially air, okay. um, you know, medium, you know, I can look at the, the wrist and forearm and I can tell if it's fire or what, differentiate between fire or water. You know, I can look at the wrist, broad bone in the wrist, they're at earth. And so that can, that quick constitutional assessment helps me kind of like, home down my list of herbs that might be useful for them, but also to help me hone in on some patterns of dysfunction that might go with that constitutional type and lead me to maybe ask some really pertinent questions. Yeah. Uh, the more practice you are, practice, 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 the quicker you can do that. So, you know, where you might take several minutes to do it when you're just starting out by the time you've been doing it two or three years you're glancing and it's 30 seconds and you already got that information so this is where just experience and practice becomes it's just super important i can't stress it enough yeah yeah you just have to look and diagnose from just looking boom yeah totally boom William was fascinated to be able to do that. Like one person told a story how she just walked in the room and he and he said, so when did you break your tailbone? I mean, he could just tell that maybe from the way she walked or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whereas we know Phyllis in a class, she was looked at people's tongues. Oh, when did you break your tailbone? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> um, these things, and then that can mess up your whole system, um, even if you, quote, recovered really nicely due to um, um, modern medicine or whatever, emergency at the time. Yeah, let's see. I thought I'd go over how I take a case real quickly. We did this um, mm -hmm. in the first class, I think, that, or second that Phyllis and I taught. And well, the first class, by the way, was more on legalities and stuff. And that's really a worthwhile class. All this is on tape out there in the in the ethers or rather on our facebook page but um let's see but uh culpepper says how to take it he says uh, he has a little an essay called uh, a, a key to galen's method of physic and he says first find the temperature or the energetics second the appropriations or the organ affinities um or the organ where is the where is the disease in the organs so like Chinese medicine, you look at, you know, it's the liver, like we say in herbal medicine, or the heart, we mean the circulatory system. Yeah, well, maybe more the heart, those, the vessels, the capillaries, wherever you hone down some, you know, or um, or the kidneys. And, and very often the disease is in that organ. So you have that organ specificity. So that's number two. And then I always look for those specific indications, something so exact. Are you worse in damp, hot weather? Has this been ever since... If you had this fatigue ever since damp hot weather, well, boom, you know, and pretty soon you can just ask questions and yes, 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 yes. And that's impressive. You know, that helps. That shows mm -hmm. you know what you're doing. And then they're like, oh, OK. So that's a little tidbit. And then uh, and then the tongue pulse and facial diagnosis and wrists and uh, legs, I guess, too. Francis will be teaching. Um, uh, one or two of our classes with me in Minnesota, and um, uh, it sounds like we had to do um, diagnosis from the feet and the arms, which is related to. Yeah, be, um, be prepared to show your your calf or yeah, where the yeah. right ankle. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and loose clothes is up, up to your knee, I guess. Is, is yeah, something like that. It's really yeah. helpful. Yeah. No, no, um, 80 lace, 80 eyed shoes, laces, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, but that also ties into Phyllis's system because, um, Southern folk medicine, because basically, I know so, um, uh, Francis and I wrote most of I wrote most of the book, but Francis really was, um, I couldn't have written it without him, I needed an intuitive 
like somewhat brain to bounce things off. And he added in really some great observations and stuff. And then Phyllis added in at the last, kind of in the in the tail end, helped finish it up. And we got less stuff from Phyllis, actually, although she has some great chapters. I think the elemental medicine is in there. That's a great chapter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but one thing, then after we were done, I think we talked a year or two later, and we both kind of agreed, yeah, we, I mean, we learned all this to learn the system of pulse diagnosis, and then you kind of simplify it all once you know it, and it's like, where is the blood, what's it doing, like, you know, and you look at it, everything, it's, it's, it kind of simplifies it, you learn the whole system, and then you learn what the blood is doing, and you can feel it in the pulse, yeah. You can see it in the body too. Yeah, you look you look in the body a lot. The face, uh, even the stomach, the legs. You look at what the blood's doing. You can you can see it. So it's the more you look, the the more helpful it is. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes if you don't look, you miss a huge thing. You may maybe there's like two hundred varicose veins, and you've been seeing the person for three months, and you never had to look at their legs, and they never mentioned it, and you're like, oh, geez, there's all the huge blood stagnation. So it's, uh, you have to look at what the blood's doing all over the place. Um. <laughs> we have a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, we do. We have one that goes back to the black walnut. Do you use a leaf or the hull, Phyllis? I use the, the husk. Which is the hull. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Or we call it the hull in the rest of the country. Nope. All right. <laughs> I just um, learned today that um, a horse apiece is a local phrase. A horse apiece? What is that? A horse apiece? Yeah. Well, it's a Hutchinson phrase. I never heard that. Wow. I thought everybody knew that. It's like um, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. I'm really surprised you don't know that one, Matthew. Apparently, it's it's attributed to the Wisconsin people, but... I must have just gotten the the correct path to learn that one. Okay. Um, Kimberly asks, what course of action do you recommend for a new herbalist who is looking to learn as much as possible, but who will be moving to South America without having the opportunity to apprentice under a teacher in the U.S.? So you're moving, I mean, do you have the chance to study with someone there? Where, Where are you moving to, by the way? Oh, well, she can tell us. Yeah. But, um, gee, so try to study there. Well, first of all, you can study Western herbalism long distance. Um, You can study, uh, oh, Epstein virus. And yeah, okay. uh, I will, that's Baptisia. Um, Vicky just asked about um, the herb or it's, and it's a little bit toxic. So, um, uh, Brazil, and I'm learning Portuguese. Oh, interesting. Golly. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of good stuff to learn in, uh, um, that, I mean, that may be available in uh, Brazil, too. There, there is. There is. Um, uh, I don't know what part of Brazil she's moving, but um, there's some local folks here that I know are from Brazil, and they're very involved with um saving the herbs from the rainforest oh. and um, how they're still being used by the local people oh. and um so there's quite a good so there's quite a good network of traditional healers and um traditional herb use down there so i don't like i say i don't know what part she's moving but she should be able to find somebody local to study with to teach your local plants. Otherwise, okay. on to the online school with Matthew and Phyllis. Absolutely. I can answer a few questions here. Actually, she's moving to Giamancina, which is an area that I lived in for a year, right next door um, in Brazil, which is a really beautiful place in Minas Gerais. So it's General Mills, literally, is the state. And Guevilla is the region. So it's quite a ways from the Amazon region. But um, there should definitely be some native local people and um, very down-to-earth people in that area. I don't know any personally, but 
um, if I can help you in that. I do speak Portuguese, and if you need a little help initially, I can certainly mm-hmm. help you out with that. Um, well, you are just full of surprises there. Yep, a few. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun and um, very, very wonderful people. Yeah, you can email me, hello at woodherbs.com. And then um, another student is asking, um, she's just wondering where to start uh, on the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. Yes, there are a lot of courses. And one of my next projects is to help direct you a little bit better because I know there's a lot there. Um, A really great place to start is the Materia Medica. Uh, I said that's just hands down. It's only $8 a month. Super great place to start. She says, um, she says, I'm an acupuncturist and I have a solid understanding of evaluating conditions, but I know almost nothing about herbs. So definitely then Materia Medica is a really great place to start. Yeah, I, I'm fairly sure she could probably get uh, continuing education credits for the class that Francis and I are teaching and probably any of these. I think people. Um, yeah, yeah no? well, she's probably some kind of free hours. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, the, and um, possibly also me and Phyllis, we haven't really looked into it, but at least in the old days, acupuncturists have always been able to get uh, continuing ed credits for studying with uh, members of the American Herbalist Guild. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. Uh, oh. And yeah. Victoria writes, I do have a teacher. I don't have a teacher here in the Lake District of the U.K., we may be related, you know, I'm from the Yorkshire woods. Um, there's a half this half of the West Riding is named Wood. I have self-learned a small amount, but still get a wee bit nervous trying new herbs and also with correct doses. Um, how best to overcome this? I know it's totally just in my mind, the nerves. Okay, yeah. Well, of course, they do have... it. Um, Great Britain has more, um, uh, gee, and my husband is called Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, one of my Facebook uh, friends is Matthew Wood Buzzard, and I'm like envious of that name. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so you can apprentice with herbalists. There's, um, you know, in UK, herbal medicine is much more organized it's not regulated by the um by the government but nim the national institute of medical herbalists has is such a well-known um professional group that it has prestige and oh lancashire there is a university of lancashire program there a three-year i believe but even a master's degree graham tobin a very good teacher is a teacher in that program so uh, the Lake District, I, I think, is near Lancashire, and um, uh, I think it is a little country. But um, so there's some options, and then there just will be actual herbalists and actual apprenticeships, etc. There are more practicing herbalists in the in the UK probably than almost any Western country. I would say they're more accepted. Yeah. And yeah. there's a whole. Um there's a whole movement of English folk herbalism that's beginning to take off and they have a conference every year, something radical herbalism. Yeah. Is the name of the conference. Yeah. Um, so you can check those folks out. They're all into um, traditional folk uses of English herbs. Yeah. And, and McIntyre. Is yeah. And, um, uh, really, the herbal tribe is one of the most interesting, um, fun tribes. It's got a little infected in the last year with the uh, political correct, uh, but um, but it always was one of the most truly alternative, fun uh, groups mm-hmm. to, um, participate in these um, uh, um, conferences and stuff. So, and you just learn from every herbalist, whoever's near you, study with them, and then study online. And, you know, and you do you do kind of have to study what they look like, how to pick them, taste of them in person with somebody that knows what they're doing. But otherwise, so yeah. Another uh, question. You gotta, you gotta study the plants themselves where they grow. You gotta. Yeah, I remember. Oh, I've got to let them be a teacher too. Yeah. 
Um, one city over from you, Toronto, uh, John Redden, a great teacher. And um, when he was young, he used to go to an herb store there. And this guy ran this herb store. And he had these very unusual um, compositions, formula, formulations. And, and so finally, after many years, and the guy trusted him, John asked him, well, where did these come from? Like, who, what tradition is this? And he said, well, actually, the truth is, I don't actually know anything about herbs whatsoever. But when I was a kid uh, growing up on the farm in Ontario, the fairies would talk to me and uh, they told me all these formulas. <laughs> and, uh, so that's oh. these are. So I said to John immediately, I said, and did you save any of those formulas? <laughs> like, <laughs> the guy's gone now. I, I can't remember why I brought that up, but I guess there's teachers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Trust. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another question? Someone's just clarifying is wild indigo baptisium? Yeah, the same thing. It's a yeah. slightly toxic herb, so one drop dose is enough for the homeopathic. Yeah. 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 Alexis asks, what in-person schools in the U.S. do you each think highly of or recommend? Oh, there's got to be so many. Where do you live? <laughs> we'll ask. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say, well, so an interesting one, Thomas Easley's uh, the Eclectic Institute in the mountains of North Carolina is a um, residential school where you actually live for a year unless you live somewhere close by. And that's good. He, I, I would say he teaches more digestive tract um, um, uh, health through the digestive tract a little bit, almost more than herbalism. But um, uh, so that's an orientation there. Everybody has their orientations. Um, Kelly, I mean, in New England, you know, um, well, of course, there's uh, Rosemary still uh, teaches. Uh, of course, there's Phyllis down there in the south. Uh, Margie Flint and um, uh, Wendy Fogg in New England up there on the coast and probably Deb Soul. Um, I would also say, what would you want to do with the information from the herb school? Because there are a lot of different yeah. herbal approaches. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if somebody wanted to be like a clinical herbalist or would somebody, or are you wanting to be um, um, kind of like a grower more or a medicine maker more? So what direction, that's the question I want to ask. What direction do you want to go in? So that would help pinpoint an herb school a little yeah, bit. If you want to practice, make sure there's a practical, like, like a, a clinic at the school or something, uh, like a student clinic to see yeah. so you can actually learn. Yeah. Some programs don't have that. Uh, they just have the information, but they don't have a, there's no, no practical right. part. So that's, uh, you have to look at this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and even on our Institute here, we've made sure Phyllis and I to have um, uh, student intakes. And I do have to say too, that learning online clinic, actually that's mostly what Thomas does um, is out there in the middle of nowhere. And, North Carolina there, there's not a whole lot of um, people that are interested in, you know, <laughs> first, there's some, but, um, but the students mostly are doing case histories uh, on online. And um, that's actually almost like what you're going to do a lot. If you're going to become a professional herbalist, you gotta, gotta set up a website period. Uh, if you want to be a practitioner. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I see you're, you're nodding. Um, Francis, and he has the advantage of having a acupuncture license, which is a little bit more. Yeah, that brings in more people. So it's good sometimes to have a like a second skill that can bring yeah. in some people. It's hopefully a, like a more popular skill. Oh, also, yeah. I live in a big city, so that's kind of a life choice. You want to maybe want to be an herbalist way out in nature. I live in a really urban environment and I get out to nature, but living here there's a million people you know outside my door so i i actually get enough i've i can just set up an office and there's plenty of people in that million to i can get us like a 0.5 percent of that million or something to come see me oh okay but i don't want to it's i i know a lot of successful herbalists in the country too and i can think of right there in minnesota uh bunny 
Krakow down in Winona and um, out in Hutchinson, um, Connie, Connie, uh, Carson. Connie Carson, she also has a lamb, the lamb shop farm. So they also sell local meat and produce. So just kind of going on Francis's yeah. note about having something else that's complimentary. Mm-hmm. I, I feel actually that's one of the biggest hints there is, is that do herbalism and like herbalism and body work. Uh, the herb store where I worked was herbs, herbs and books. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, the owner of the store said herbs by itself will not make it. Books will. Still one of the greatest bookstores nowadays when it's hard to find good kind of alternative lifestyle books, yeah. uh, except online. And um, uh, so the country, it's not impossible. People will drive a distance in the country, but you will have, oh, and I will say, if you're going to be a practicing herbalist, you should make your own stuff and sell it because uh, that's part of your income. Mm-hmm. Teach classes. You absolutely have to teach classes because people don't know who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, and even you're working in the herb store, teach classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that way they get to know you and teach really simple, interesting classes. It's the best way to market yourself. Yeah. And it's free for you, or you might even make money. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. Another question? So the. F- um, someone is saying, I'm having a hard time getting an apprenticeship. I don't know where to start. I live in Massachusetts and study with the Herbal Academy online currently. Yeah. So something online is fine, but I prefer local. Mm. Margie, Margie Flint. Margie Flint. There's the Boston School of mm. Herbal Studies in Massachusetts. And then there's the, oh gosh, there's another one there. There's one actually in Boston. What is the name of that? Um, my mind's going blank. So I know. So the Boston School of Studies yeah. actually outside of Boston, close to Harvard. And then yeah. there's, there's. I'm thinking. I'm blanking on her name. What's her name? Her the, the little <sighs> north of Boston. So there's like Margie and in, in uh, Marblehead, and then there's that school slightly north, like of Boston and then um, the Boston School of Herbal Energetics um, uh, who, and they um, are more in, is it Arlington, uh, I think is where Yeah, Ar- Arlington, but, and then there's one right in Boston. Yeah, that's that one I'm trying to think of. Uh, Someone says in Massachusetts is the Commonwealth Herbal School in Boston. Okay. Commonwealth. All right. So I'm, that's I'm thinking of a total other one then too. Yeah, and then there's some herbalists in uh, kind of in the Amherst area. There's a bunch. I don't know if population centers. You got to kind of go with. And uh, oh, gee, I can't remember. There's quite a few there. There's Tony. She took over the school. I forgot the name of that school, but Northampton up north of there, or, or where that waterfall is along uh, Highway Two. Uh, near there <laughs> and um, an interesting herbalist to study with is uh, Ellen Hopman in Belchertown she was a direct student of um, William Saucier mm-hmm. oh, and, wow. yeah and there's certainly people in the New York I City lived, uh, I grew up in Amherst I lived 10 years there oh really yeah I went to high school in Amherst from so <laughs> my, um, a lot of people that are Part, part or completely French Canadian that lived down in New England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a, you know, it's not too far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thinking of which, uh, yeah. Then uh, I don't know if she teaches anymore, but um, Kate Gilday in the Adirondacks, upstate New York, and her husband Don Babineau was French Canadian too. And yeah. Boy, I don't know anybody that knows more about the wilderness than those two. Mm. Actually, I mean, especially. Uh, <laughs> and so there is a place you might be able to learn some. Yeah, I, I think up in the Northeast and the Massachusetts, there is not a, um, a there's not a drought of herb schools. Yeah. There's and quite a number. Moving into the Midwest, I should go quicker, but Jim McDonald in Michigan there. Mm-hmm. and uh, But hands on, uh, I will say, so I haven't even uh, run this past Terra, so we have to work on it more, but I've decided to do a, a uh, online apprenticeship just uh uh, I'm a, but that will be by somewhat by invitation. I'm going to make sure that people who have had a lot of experience and it's not for actual practice, 
like, well, I think we could mention case histories of our own, but it's more just uh, um, um, sharing and stuff. Um, of, yeah, that of, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. You'd probably uh, almost become a good herbalist just reading everything that's on Jim McDonald's website. <laughs> yep. That's an amazing website. Yeah, that's a really good resource. Uh, really good resource. Yeah, he collected, you know, how libraries and places collect papers. Yeah did everybody's papers yeah um, i also recommend my books and our book and dorothy hall dorothy hall yeah oh yeah dorothy hall is a great kind of more constitution yeah profile yeah that's a, Actually, just exactly like yeah, you and i practice that same way so does phyllis yeah and that is actually huang huang practices 50 minutes songs. that's the thing about him I think of myself as the Huang Huang of Western herbalism. Rather. Yeah, it's like this is really rare in the Chinese herbalism this approach, but he's really got it down, and he's he's a great. Uh, I think he's an incredibly successful herbalist over there. Yeah, and what and it's because he does specificity. Yeah, it's like not a concept in Chinese herbs so much. This no, it's like yeah. let's throw twenty five herbs at this disease. <laughs> yeah. Which actually you find in old time Western herbalism too. You do, yeah. Old time Europe for sure has these big uh, mixes, and yeah, sometimes what the hell, that's good too. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to throw a bunch of sim uh, symptoms, remedies at symptoms, but for sure, <laughs> but the more precise you can get, the better. And every once in a while, you get this specific indication. Wow, there's only one remedy I know with that. Yeah, yeah. somebody. Somebody asked about an herb school that does clinical in uh, New York, and I think doesn't Seven Song up in the Northeast School of yeah. Herbal Studies doesn't he do clinical like? Her, and he's in Ithaca, uh, New England. Yeah, yeah, Ithaca. Yeah, also okay. of course in downtown in uh, Manhattan. Um, oh Paul, yeah, Claudia Keel and Richard Mandelson. Um, they have the. Uh, Arbor Vitae School. Yeah. yeah. And I got to say, you know, uh, 10 years, there's herbalists of our generation, some of whom are more retired or, you know, not teaching as much, but there were a number of good ones and um, like Robin Rose Bennett. And, and oh, and of course, um, uh, David Winston, um, although he teaches in person and online both, I think. And, yeah. Um, I mean, we just go on and on. We haven't really moved out to California or, Oregon or anything, but um, there's just schools all over the place. Um, what did I think of? Uh, San Diego, there's a school I forgot in Oceanside. Um, Howie Bernstein teaches up in uh, um, Brownstein, uh, uh, Brownstein, yeah, up in um, Eugene. And I taught this year in Ashland here. I don't know if I'll teach next year. But, I'll have to see, and uh, um, uh, I don't know, all everywhere. <laughs> in Boulder, good school. <laughs> and we're not even talking about there's a Dr. Christopher herbalist that would be Salt Lake City. Right. Yeah. So, uh, San, well, I teach in Santa Fe some, so next weekend included. And so. there's uh, Sam Kaufman down in San San yeah. In Right in uh, in Texas, and uh, our friend at Wildflowers, um, Nicole um, Telkus in, in uh, Austin. Boston. Yeah. 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 You and then there's the all kinds of schools in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, and in uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There's more than enough herbalists in in Nashville. In uh, Asheville. Asheville. Yeah. Um, Another question. You bet. So, uh, someone yeah, asked. In Minnesota is a ufta. <laughs> yeah, where there's a horse apiece among them, or something like that. <laughs> so, someone asked, "Is it difficult to set up a private practice?" I have family who work in traditional Chinese medicine, and they told me it would be difficult because of the regulations. Specifically, I want to open a clinic clinic for the poor and others who need medicine that's less expensive. Well, herbalism uh, is a do-it-yourself affair, and um, as long as you don't, you know, diagnose or prescribe 
say you have to take this or don't do what the doctor says, things like that. We went over this in, in uh, the first uh, class that Phyllis and I taught, but it's not, it's not that scary. It was scarier 30 years ago. It was really scary 40, 50 years ago. Uh, at least in most places, not Alabama so much, but um, in much of the country. So um, I, I outside of France. Oh, France has really gotten them not like just, really bad. It's yeah, really scary there, right? Yeah, yeah, real bad. Yep. Yeah. So you know, I think that if you're attentive and um, don't and and build slowly to, with your clinic and let word get around. Um, that you shouldn't have any problem, it, you know, and of course everything Matthew just said about no diagnosing and never tell anybody to stop their medication. So, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You should do okay. Yeah. Remember you're doing, this is the value of energetic diagnosis evaluation. You're doing a different thing than them. You're treating things that they don't, they don't imagine they're, you're thinking you're in a completely different dimension, like ships passing in the night. And <laughs> yeah, I would say if you have a family traditions, that especially is rather beautiful and something you really want to keep going. Yeah, and we're saying that, but also be, you know, be attentive to the local um, culture of where you are. Uh -huh. um, some states are more friendly in this regard than other states. So just just be aware of that. Yeah, although it's almost gotten to the point where just about everywhere is fairly friendly. It's I remember when I early in my practice, someone says, "Well, it's not what's against the law; it's what do the police want to enforce." You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> um, but problem. I don't think herbalists and clinics have too much trouble these days. I have no, there's eight states that have uh, freedom of practice uh, national national. Yeah. Uh, Health Freedom Coalition, look that up online. Become a member, support health freedom, including uh, freedom to not vaccinate your kids if you don't want to, um, etc. They stand for freedom in every dimension of medicine, medical choice, free choice. And something we didn't mention, but I would like to mention about, um, you know, being an excellent herbalist is always investigate. There's all kinds of Herbal rumors always going around Facebook and the internet and do your own research. I mean, today, for, for example, somebody on my Facebook feed, it popped up that there's male and female DNA and vaccinations and that this is turning everybody transgender. You know, it's like a, a big article. And I was like, Okay, this is it. I like get blown around, but I did my investigation. I went on PubMed. I started researching, and they have they are using um, male and female. They are using DNA splicing, but not in human vaccinations. They're testing it on animals. Oh, at least they're testing. Um, yeah, they are testing it on animals, and it's like you're, it's the um, antibodies that they're testing. And so this is a conceivable thing that, but it's not in humans. It's not in, in people vaccinations. Um, so do your research. And sometimes you'll get rumors like this around an herb or um, a process, uh, a natural health process or some homeopathy. I remember when the whole thing about um, echinacea back several years ago, echinacea does not big, big, steady thing. Echinacea does not help uh, the common cold. It's useless. But then when you went to dig into the research and um, you saw just how skewed the uh, media presented the research and you know it wasn't true, but now it's blaring all over the radio stations and in print magazine and everything. So I would say research, research, research also. Mm -hmm. if, if in doubt, ask somebody, if in doubt, Research it yourself. Don't take anything at face value. You never know unless you really trust the source. Should we yeah. address the last two questions and then and then close out? Yeah. yeah. Good. Sound good? So Juan Pablo Ruiz says, I find myself at a point where I know a good number of plants 
and have a basic understanding of the functions of the body, but still find myself in a rather linear, this herb for that, I would really like to go into a deeper way of working with the plants. What would you recommend for becoming more capable to see through the superficial symptoms and to get to the root cause? I live in Mexico and haven't been able to find many herbalists working in this way, at least where I live. Yeah, that's energetics again. Um, Yeah, okay. Like there would be two things in Mexico. Like for one thing, just pure folk healing often is empirical. It is to the name. That's, you go back in herbalism where it's really the... Um, common folk, folk medicine, it often is the treatment of the, of the name. Southern folk medicine is a, sta- a stage above that because high blood, low blood, thick blood, thin blood, they had an energetic system. And, you know, originally, um, you know, um, Western herbalism in general was more energetic, but that all died out. And that's probably true in Mexico to some extent. Um, uh, I would say um, I act at Phyllis's house. I found a book by George Foster on um, Central American or South American, Latin American folk medicine. And they really do use um, hot and cold. And I think it's soft and hard, but especially hot and cold are really an important part of uh, Latin American um, folk medicine. So I doubt that that's died out. And so you need to know that terminology they use instead that's a little vestige of uh spanish of uh, medicine galenic greek medicine yeah and and even the southern folk medicine book might even be useful for you because you know where i live was originally settled by the spanish and it was the spanish interaction with the native americans that kind of became the foundation of Southern folk medicine. And even, even though our plants might be somewhat different, um, the, those principles might not be so far away from what, you know, a traditional healer in Mexico might be utilizing today who over time that combination of Spanish and, and native Mexican influence come together. So you might find some similarities or something in Southern folk medicine that might be helpful. I mean, yeah. And even, even some plants, because I know, you know, often their plantain is, can be found quite easily in Mexico, you know, everywhere the Spanish went, they brought plants too. And um, and also, you know, uh, just for me, where I live in Alabama, um, we have like a lot of plants that grow here grow all the you know through Mexico and all the way down into Brazil. So we have we're we're on that border area. So even some of the plants here might be um, a species of a plant that I talk about might be a species as a plant that you have there. But I have a friend who retired to Mexico and would just go to the um, market and just, you know, gather the medicinal herbs at the market. And he knew quite a number of them. I mean, it was amazing how many plants there were in common. I mean, there's a lot of different plants for sure. Um, But this was, and this wasn't in the more desert or arid areas, but, um, so you might find, um, oh gosh, and then there's another book. I can't remember the author, but the name of the book is Wind in the Blood. Yeah. And that's a really good book that compares uh, Mexican folk medicine to TCM. Yeah, I've heard Wind of that one. Blood. Yeah, I, I almost think actually that with some if you learn the lingo they might be more forthcoming and they might be you know they might just say oh yeah i'm treating uh, asthma or something but actually they're maybe treating hot asthma or cold asthma you know right, <laughs> right. Um, but they don't always say it in a way that's easy to follow so yeah, yeah. um so, so here's phyllis's book that she was yeah. mentioning Yep. Definitely get it. Yep. <laughs> it's a great read. It is. It's, it could be a novel if it wasn't for real. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so a great question wrapping up, because I know I've thought this one many times. Michelle asks, if you're helping someone who is currently on meds, how do you proceed with herbs? Is there a protocol such as don't take herbs and meds at the same time? Obviously, any thoughts on this? Uh, uh, well, let's see. Yeah. You wanna... I, I usually, well, if they're, on, if they're on a med that I'm not familiar with, I'm going to look it up. Because, you know, meds are being turned out for certain conditions, um, new ones all the time, and it's really hard to keep up with them. So diabetic, diabetes, high blood pressure, these um, are two areas where new medications are coming out all the time. Um, another area is in pain relief and inflammation control, all kinds of drugs out there. So look them up, especially ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, because um, quite a number of interactions with foods and herbs have been cataloged with these um, common, or, uh, common drugs like for high blood pressure, you know, also cardiovascular disease. And so be aware and even read the food interactions, because sometimes um, a nutrient might interact with for instance, ACE inhibitors um, conserve potassium in the body and can get too much potassium. So then if you're doing an herb that has a whole lot of potassium, you could be contributing to this overload. So I always look, I just look it up, you know, and then after a while, you know, in your area, you'll find that the doctors tend to prescribe the same drugs over and over and over. In certain situations, you'll go, oh, yeah, that doctor, that drug. Um, and you'll have them memorized or know more about them after a while, but just look them up. Yeah, and that way you're aware, they're aware. Um, you don't go crazy. So, you know, so like dandelion is something I might normally recommend because it's potassium sparing diuretic, which would be useful for high blood pressure, but not with an ACE inhibitor. Mm. Right. So you have to, you know, think along those lines, I think is very helpful um, to get you started and then kind of go from there. I'd also say um, uh, I use such small doses. I'm a lot less worried about this, which is one of the values of small doses, actually. And I, I don't know if Francis, you, do you use small doses too, or? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Uh, using fairly small doses, you're you're a lot more in the safe zone. Yeah. Uh, even if there uh, might be some kind of possible interaction, if you're using a few drops of tincture, like one to ten drops, yeah. uh, you're really in a much safer place than if you're uh, using large amounts of uh, decoction or tea or large amounts of tinctures. Yeah. And also, uh, if you're not treating so often, uh, people have a medication for a disease name, of course. But if you're treating uh, their underlying pattern, uh, you're also uh, much more in a safe zone. Uh, but if you're trying to give an herb that's going to work the same as their medication, they're trying to find some kind of that, that's like a, you're, you're, you're not, uh, that's not so good. Um, yeah. Also, the more you, yeah, the more you can prescribe according to like uh, your own, uh, like the tongue and the pulse and the skin and the constitution, you're really, you're, you're just, the more you can do that, the safer it is. Yeah, but it's a matter of experience too. It's a matter of knowing, like, oh, this person's on blood thinner, but I'm still gonna give them yarrow because because I'm pretty sure it's gonna help and not cause harm. There's always a bit of a gamble, and that, but that's I think that's medicine too. There's always like, yeah. if I do this, is it gonna? It might help a lot, or there's a small chance it might not help, or there's a small chance it might actually cause a little harm. But I'm gonna go for it. Boom! It's a gamble. Um, that's like a. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a beginner thing, but you know, one day you start treating people after years. If you're still into it, everyone's taking medications. Your clients come to you; they have like five diagnoses and eight meds, and you're like, "Well, am I going to do something here or just not?" But then, 
I mean, I have to say, I think 90% of my clients are taking at least three to seven medications and they're yeah. maybe like 70 years old. So if yeah, you, especially the older people are taking meds. Yeah, yeah they're, well, most of them are taking meds. So if you actually want to give them herbs, you kind of have to deal with this somehow. And yeah, using small doses is a good start. <laughs> And yeah, like and, said, and, yeah. If you don't know a medication for sure, you look it up, and you can even tell your client that you're like, "Geez, what a crazy name! We have to look this up." You can even do it with the client. They they're not gonna if they kind of trust you and they know you're good with herbs. They're not gonna care. They're gonna be happy that you're looking it up. You know. And, that's okay. right. So that's no big deal. You don't have to like pretend uh, or <laughs> something. Yeah, it's better to <laughs> better to know what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they got to look stuff up all the time. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. So last one. I think. Do you want to do one more, or I'm going to talk about oh, let's, all that you guys have available? Uh, I think we've had enough. Let's yeah, have you. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, Matt mentioned several times the course between him and Phyllis. So I'm going to show you quick how to find that. So Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism dot com or Matt Wood Herbs dot com. And I have that we have that under the new and noteworthy. This will probably be changing in the future to navigate, you know, where you can find newbie stuff and and that kind of thing. But um, the Holistic Herbal Assessment Skills is the class that's still ongoing with Matt and Phyllis. The early classes that Matt had mentioned where they get into kind of the legal stuff and how to get started, legal and ethical implications, holism versus reductionism, really great for uh, someone who is beginning and really is interested in, in starting their own practice. Um, some really essential stuff here. Then partway through, we start doing um, a class where we have a volunteer client. And this volunteer client is someone that Phyllis and Matt assess either in person or online. So you get to see the principles that they're talking about and teaching about in action. So you actually get to sit in on a clinical assessment, which is really, really helpful most of our classes, a lot of our classes on the Matthew Wood Institute of, Herb of Herbalism have a live component. So as you see here, it says next class. That means that this Wednesday, you could, if you join in on this class um, in this course, you could join us live to see how they assess this next volunteer client. Hi, I just realized I'll be traveling at that time, I'm afraid to say. We will have to, subject to change, we either have to do that at a separate time or maybe we can have Francis work with Phyllis instead of me or something, but, uh, yeah, we will, see that we will work it out. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Wednesdays. I, I got to get out of the habit of traveling on Wednesdays. That was my old practice middle of the week. Easier for me. Darn so as it. you see, we have a few other classes coming yet. Um, so you can join at any time, um, and you can catch up and, or join just right in the middle and then, um, uh, follow along. So if I go back to the homepage, Phyllis, Francis, and Matthew will be teaching the upcoming pulse, tongue, and facial assessment. And they, uh, Matthew will be at all of them, and then Phyllis and Francis on their own dates. But there's all the information that you can find here uh, on this page. So you can find that there just by accessing it through the homepage. And you can join us live in person. Okay, there's a lot of writing. I know there's a lot of writing, but I haven't gotten many questions. So it seems like the lot of writing has been very helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is held at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. It is really a, just a beautiful place. Yep. And we go for herb walks. And um, it's just, it's really wonderful. There's local farm to table places or a co-op to eat at. There's even a local cafe. You can join in person or online. Our, our options and the payment plan option is actually closing at the end of the month. So if you, you definitely want to join in and we even have options, have, have information on how you can travel and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, a link to their book together. So yes, the payment plan option is ending at the end of the month, just kind of a logistical thing there. Um, so if you're interested and you want to join in on the payment plan, just know that that is closing 
on April 30th. And um, so definitely take advantage of that. Uh, we're already half full and it's, it's still four months away. So just know that you want to reserve your seat as soon as possible. The great thing is too, when you reserve an actual seat to attend in person, you also automatically get uh, a, a seat online. So for, ha- for example, if a, ch- a kid is sick or for some reason you have to stay home, that you can attend online instead that day. Um, and it also includes a two-year access to the content. Um, there will be tests so that you can earn a certificate. And um, ongoing, like for most of our courses also, um, there's a live component, but there's also ongoing support from teachers. So there's a discussion section. And so you can still, even a year down the road, if you have a question of one of our teachers, you can access them there. And I think that covers most of it. That's good. Yay. Good. It will be amazing. <laughs> Keep your horses or whatever that is. Yes. <laughs> A horse for everybody. <laughs> um, well, I would like to announce that in May, um, May 18th and 19th, I'll be doing a class at Earthwise Learning Center in Anderson, South Carolina, um, down at Robin McGee's place. And we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing thyroid, adrenals, everything, anything you want to know. Come and join us. Just get in touch with the Robin. You know, I'm thinking here that uh, you and me and Francis ought to do a uh, thyroid class just out of nowhere, just the thyroid, uh, or two classes perhaps, because um, I know you and I have talked about this, and uh, I mean, Phil's, Phil's really taught me how to treat the thyroid because black walnut is so important. But um, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of really simple. You can just help. You could help millions of people, frankly. So yeah, are, it's like the the common issue. Yeah, that, yeah. That the doctors can't fix usually. So yeah, yeah. So um, and even when they're on synthroid or uh, armor thyroid, it's still uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah. They still need the remedies. So yeah. to, um, yeah. I agree. A thyroid class we have. Yeah. All so, right. Well, not until after Robbins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Y'all come see me at Robbins. Yes. Right. Right. Well, uh, have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at matthewwoodinstituteofherbalism.com. You can find all of our social links in the description below. Also, please subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with the latest videos.